So in the beginning of this series, uh, I mentioned that there is no such thing as private prayer, right, for a Christian. Uh, there is a minimum of four people involved when you pray. It is you, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. And then we spoke about also how the moment your uh, knees fall to the ground to pray, others start getting involved, like the devil and the angels and spiritual beings. And tonight I think there's, uh, it's important for us to discuss another uh, crucial dimension of prayer, uh, a dimension that I personally struggle with the most, and yet it's something that is so required. And I don't know if you noticed, but every single worship song that we did today had one word in common. We or us. So what we're going to be looking at today is prayer with the saints, prayer as a body, praying together. Remember, prayer is not a solo thing. Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father. It wasn't just my Father and give me today my daily bread. It was give us our daily bread. Once you become a Christian, you stop being an individual and you become a part of a body. And it's that whole body that starts to pray. That's what Jesus also did. Remember in the Garden of uh, Gethsemane, just before he, the night before he was crucified, Jesus wanted his disciples to pray with him. He kept asking them to pray together. He kept going to them and waking them up and saying, can't you all pray? He wanted it to be a together thing. In John 17, he prayed this intense prayer, which seems so personal, but it's a prayer he prayed in the midst of his disciples. You know, uh, when we pray, what's actually happening is we join our prayers with thousands of others and it goes up to God and God hears each one of them individually and together. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at some biblical basis for praying as a body. And also we'll talk about the practical difficulties that come with it. And you know, there are many practical difficulties that come when it comes to praying together. And we'll see what we can do about those also. Right. So starting with the biblical basis for praying together, did you know that the New Testament, there is more about praying together than about praying alone? Right? For example, in the book of Acts, there's so much written about all of them gathering together and praying together. Even now with the passage that we read, you saw that all the believers were one mind or one heart. They met together to pray together. In the book of Revelation, there is so much written about praying together. Jesus gave us this promise where two or three are gathered in my name, I am in the midst of them. That also is about praying together, right? Uh, three weeks back, we learned about how to pray in Jesus' name and how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Uh, he used the words in my name at least five times in one instance, trying to tell them that they need to pray in Jesus' name. But you know, when he was saying that, he was saying, when you pray in my name, and that you that is written in Greek, it wasn't singular, it was plural. And he was telling his disciples, pray together in my name. In the book of Acts, uh, between the Ascension and the Pentecost, the 10 days that the disciples, the apostles spent together, they were spending it together, praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They were not in their homes praying individually. They were together when they were filled. I think the issue is that too many of us want to be filled individually for some reason, or we want to be filled privately. But imagine if we could get a group of 120 people together. That's the number of people that was gathered in the book of Acts, by the way. And imagine if we could get that together and pray together till we were all filled. In Acts chapter 2, these same people, 120 people, get 3,000 people to start believing in Jesus. And that's the power of praying together. That's the power that comes with the outpouring of the Spirit when you pray together. It didn't stop there. They went on to teach these 3,000 people how to be Christians. And what did they teach them? They, they taught these 3,000 people to gather together for fellowship and to pray together. In the passage that uh, Jessica just read so beautifully, we see that the apostles were arrested because they were preaching in Jesus' name. And they were told to never speak about the name of Jesus again. Or at least in Jesus' name again. And you know what they did? They gathered together. 
and they prayed for more boldness to preach Jesus' name. When you pray together, you can pray for boldness more clearly because it's you have that support with you, other believers to rely on as well. And when you're alone, that's when the devil can pick you one by one. Right? Just being together in prayer can be such a source of support and strength. Which is why Jesus also, when he sent the 12 apostles or when he sent the 72 disciples, he sent them out to preach and heal two by two, not one by one. He sent them out in pairs. It can be so helpful if you have a fellow believer or a fellow believing brother or sister in every walk of your life. Even in your job, for example. Uh, an example would be Rahel here. Uh, She's been working in this organization for years now and one day she found a colleague who was a fellow believer. And since that day, I think the two of them have gathered regularly to pray for their company, right? Can you imagine the blessing over their work and over their company because of this? Can you imagine how much support they have for each other because they're doing this? And for those of y'all, if y'all are in jobs where you're the only Christian or even in certain areas of your life where you're the only Christian, Ask God to send someone else to support you and for you also to support. It can make such a huge difference. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 32 verse 30. It says, How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight unless their rock had sold them, unless the Lord had shut them up? God's mathematics makes no sense. One person can chase 1,000, two can chase 10,000. That's the power of doing it in a group. And by group, I mean just two people or three people. Acts chapter 12, uh, Peter is put in prison for his faith. And there are believers gathered in a house together praying for him. And as they are praying, there's a knock on the door and uh, the servant girl opens the door. And it's Peter who's come out of prison because an angel has set him free. And this girl who's been praying for Peter to be set free somehow doesn't believe it. And she runs in and says, there's someone there. It's Peter. How can it be? And call it whatever you want that. But uh, the fact is they were praying together. And every time people pray together, God did something so powerful. Every time they wanted to send out missionaries, they met together and prayed. In the book of Revelation, you hear this. You hear stories about the church being persecuted. And you hear what their defense is in a time of persecution. There's incense rising up to heaven, which is the prayer of the saints. Believers holding each other and praying together. See, the enemy loves to get us separately, but there's power in praying together. So let's just take a look at what united prayer can do that separate prayer can't do. Which is, uh, I just want to say it out loud and clear, I am not dissing separate prayer at all. Because next week we will be doing prayer by yourself. Okay, uh, there is power in praying hidden in your room. That's what Jesus told us to do. But today we're going to focus on praying together as well. So there's three things I think that praying together can do. One is it can turn prayer into a school. What that means is we can learn so much about prayer by listening to others pray than by reading any book on prayer. Or by listening to any sermon on prayer. We can learn so much by hearing others pray. Repeat. We can, uh, it turns prayer into a school. And we can learn so much by praying together because we hear others pray. Right? You will learn things by watching others pray that you would have never otherwise learned. You start to get a better vision when you pray. A bigger picture, more clarity on the things to pray for. Because it stops being about you. And becomes about the body that's gathered. Second thing it does is it turns prayer into a furnace or a fireplace. If you take a piece of coal from the furnace and put it out by itself, what happens to it? It remains a piece of coal. It is still coal. It's got the potential and the fuel within it, but it slowly starts to lose heat. And starts going cool. But if you start feeling cool, then just jump back into the fireplace. Get in among the glowing coals. Get in among faithful, godly believers and see the difference it makes to your faith. You'll feel your faith burning. Uh, Martin Luther had this to say, In my house there is no warmth within me, but within the church a fire is kindled in my heart. 
I cannot stress how important it is for us to be with people who are strong in faith. It is scary the world we live in today because of the number of people who are just being fed with lies one by one who are not involved in a fellowship and who are just fading away one by one because they don't have people around them to support them. Get into the fireplace, catch the glow, get warmed up and then warm others up. Set the world on fire. Three, it turns prayer into a powerhouse. Is there anyone here who's done engineering? Is there anyone here who's done electrical engineering? No one, right? Okay, good. No one can correct me. Uh, have you seen a cable that carries electricity? Right? It's, it's never one strand that makes up the cable. It's always a collection of wires. And God has so ordained prayer that if you put a lot of strands together, there's just superpower released. Uh, apparently, uh, decades back, there was this guy who went around the world and did this research on how churches grow. This is a story I've heard. I haven't checked out the research myself, but uh, he, he went around conducting interviews of how churches grew in numbers. And he found out there was this one common factor in every church that was growing. Whether it was this big uh, Catholic or Anglican church or it was a small independent house church in a small building, he found one thing common. The churches that were all growing were churches where groups of two or three or six or twelve Christians met regularly to pray for non-believers by name. Meeting together in the name of Jesus to pray for others who need Jesus by name and it made a huge difference. Now unfortunately you can't do that in a big crowd. You can't do that in a public service of 100 and 200 or 50. Right? But you can do it in a group of two, three, four, five, or whatever. There is power in it. That's what prayer does. A school, a furnace, and a powerhouse. Now let's talk about the difficulties in praying together. And some of you already know many of them. And so I just want to address six practical problems that come with praying together. And these are not issues. They're just practical, small inconveniences that can be fixed. And... Uh, I'm a hypocrite for saying this, but I do not believe that these issues should stop any of us from praying. And I know for me it has. But we shouldn't let it stop us from gathering together to pray. So number one problem is the problem of people who stay silent. That's a problem when we're together, isn't it? Right? Uh, sometimes when a person is too shy to pray, it can hinder a group prayer. Most of the time, it's just a psychological issue. We tend to overthink. We wonder what people will think about our prayers. We wonder if our prayers will be effective at all. Uh, some of us think that the one thing we can never do in a group is pray. Or in a prayer meeting, the one thing that we can never do is pray. Like we're willing to, I don't know, uh, cook a meal for the entire church or lead worship to maybe a crowd of thousands, but we're just so scared of praying aloud. One reason for that I've already told you in the beginning. Uh, many cannot pray loudly in front of people because you're not used to praying loudly when you are alone. And that's a good starting point. But otherwise, some of us are just shy and we're scared to pray aloud. So I just want to ask, show of hands, how many of you feel like that? Uh, so for the people who are shy and people who are a little apprehensive about praying out loud in prayer meetings, I'm going to give you a little bit of surprise here. And you're not going to like it. After this, we will be getting into a short time of prayer and all of us are going to pray. Right? But there is a good part to that surprise uh, because the question I'm asking, <laughs> the question I'm asking you is not, can you pray out loudly in front of others? The question is, would you like to? Would you want to like to pray with the saints? Would you want to pray with other believers? Would you like to learn? Have you ever asked yourself that? So the good part here is we're going to talk about how we can pray together and you're going to have some time and uh, that we'll do that at the end uh, after the other points and we'll see how to do that, right? But God wants you to get over your psychological barrier. God wants you to pray. There is another reason that we can be silent during prayers. 
you can have resentment in your heart that could be stopping you. Remember Jesus said, forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Jesus also said, if you have a gift or offering to give God and you have something against your neighbor, go reconcile with your neighbor first and then come to God and lay that gift at the altar. So those can be, uh, that's, that's not the second problem that comes under silent itself. So problem number two is people who pray too softly. It's a practical problem, isn't it? Like if you have to say amen and agree with my prayer, then you have to be able to hear what it is. So out of love for others, we've got to make sure that we are audible when we pray. Third problem, and this is my favorite one, lengthy prayers. Now, the amount of time people can concentrate on one person's prayer is very, very limited. Most people cannot concentrate for more than one minute, it is said. But I don't think that's true. I think it's 30 seconds or less. At least that's the case for me. Mm. After one minute, people's thoughts will start to wander away. Which is why sometimes common prayers can also be powerful. And if you've noticed, common prayers are always short. For example, that's, that's why we started with, that, with reading that prayer out loud together. And it was quite a short prayer, wasn't it? 20 seconds. If we are going to have to pray together, then we are going to have to learn to be brief. Long prayers can put a lot of people off. Just something to be mindful of when we pray. Problem number four unnecessarily serious types of prayers. Now this isn't really a problem, but it can be unnecessary. Uh, there's a story of a guy who would constantly pray in every single prayer meeting. And you may know people who constantly say the same phrase in every single prayer meeting. So there was this one guy who every prayer meeting, he would say, Lord, sweep the cobwebs of my heart. Every single time he would say that. Until one day, another man came and heard it and said, Lord, just kill that spider. Point is, we can easily get into this rut with intense theology that others may not even understand. And it's so important to keep that in mind. Problem number five, praying in public the same way you pray when you are alone. Prayers that would have been more appropriate in your bedroom. Prayers that are all about I, 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 I. But when we come to pray together, we must seek to pray the kind of prayers that would take others with us to the throne of grace. And that just needs a little care. Problem number six is the problem of discontinuity. You see, when you pray in a group, each prayer kind of flows from the other. One person thanks God for something. And if you are next, you can be inspired to thank God for something else. And there's this kind of flow. But imagine in the midst of that flow, someone else interrupts and says, Oh, I just remember that we need to pray for this person who's going through this and this and this. And completely change the flow of it all. And it's difficult for the other person after that to come back into the flow, right? Now, there's absolutely a time and place for it. It's absolutely important to pray in a way the Spirit leads us. But it is also crucial that we be, be mindful. We must listen to the prayers prayed before us to say Amen to those. So these are just some of the issues. And you can see that they can be easily solved by just being a little mindful. So now let's just quickly take a look at what groups of prayer look like. The first circle is, like I mentioned, group of two or three. If you find it difficult to pray in a large prayer meeting, then just start with two people. Talk to someone you trust. Ask them and tell them, hey, listen, can we meet once in two weeks to just pray for five minutes? Uh, Billy Graham once went into a town and had the biggest turnout for his crusade than ever. And it shocked him that he just started inquiring about what happened. And, and he found out that there were two invalid, unmarried ladies who couldn't leave their home, who prayed together for six years that God would work in their town. A tiny cell of two or three can do wonders. And that can just be your, you and your best friend or your wife or your husband or anyone. A bigger cell can be 10 or 12, which is basically almost what this Zoom call is. Uh, and you can see bigger cells in most churches. This is personally the part where I struggle with, uh, but I know I must learn to be a part of it and so must you. 
And then there's the larger circle, which is the whole church. And we meet together as one and pray and worship through songs and pray through songs. And of course, the problems associated with bigger churches are also more, but practical problems like sound and everything, but which can obviously be solved. Uh, so here's a, just a fun fact for you. You know, in, uh, in many churches, the liturgies are sung. Like they just go, la, 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 la. I, I, I'm not going to show, an ex I'm not going to give an example, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Liturgies that are sung in many places. There's actually a practical reason that was done. Earlier days, they had no mic. And the buildings were built in such a way that the acoustics were perfect to resonate one note. So they would just go there and hum until they found that note. And then they would sing the entire liturgy in that note so that the entire church could hear. That's what was done. It's unnecessary now, but it still goes on. Uh, anyway, when it comes to the larger church, I do believe there is a place for prayers out of a book. That's what we do with worship songs, right? We read them out from a book and we sing them to God. And even with prayers from a book, there can be unity. And imagine the sound of the Amen as the whole church can say it together. It's just beautiful. There's a larger circle than a church building, which is the Church of Jesus Christ. Whenever we pray, we join with the whole church throughout the world. And there's this 24-hour cycle of prayer constantly going up to heaven. That's what it means to pray with the saints. And then there's the biggest circle, the church on earth with the company of heaven. With the great cloud of witnesses mentioned in the book of Hebrews, all the archangels and the angels praising God and we get to join them. We just sang that we are joined by angels. It's this huge circle of heavenly hosts and earthly beings. Uh, you know, sometimes I get annoyed when I sing off in a worship when I go off tune and it's like this song is written so beautifully and I'm just ruining it when I go off but I've realized now that with every note that I sing whether it's off or in tune with the song there is at least one angel worshipping and harmonizing with me and the whole thing coming together is just this beautiful melodious offering that is going up to God isn't that awesome When you pray and worship, you are doing it together with the host of heaven. When you pray, even in your room, privately, you are holding a prayer meeting with heavenly beings. And that's Christian prayer, prayer with the saints. And the question really is, why? Why has God made it this way? Why should it please God more when prayer is done together? Right? And... Honestly, I, I don't think there's one biblical verse that says, here's why God loves prayer together or anything. But I think it's because he's a father. Now, I think none of us here are parents. So it may be difficult for us to understand this. Uh, but have you ever been around children who are siblings? Or have you noticed how they are always, if you have, then have you noticed how they're always disagreeing about what to watch on TV or on Netflix or what to play on their phone? And there's always some sort of, argument between them like we've seen it with our friends when when it's tv time you can always hear one of them complaining to uh, the mother or father that the other child isn't putting the right tv show on right and and every time an argument like that takes place it always annoys the parents but imagine this imagine that those two children want something so badly together that they get together in good relationship and in love and they agree and they go ask their father or mother. The very fact that they've agreed together, it's not easy for a dad or mom to say no to that. Why? Because a parent would love to see their children cooperate. God is our father and it delights his heart to see us come together to pray. He loves to see his family agreeing with each other to be in unity. He loves to see his children of one heart and one mind. That's what happened at Pentecost. They were praying in one accord. No wonder he poured out his spirit and there was this huge outpouring. He doesn't just want us to be filled as individuals. He wants to fill his whole body. 
He wants to give us His Spirit. He waits for us to agree and to say Amen together. And when we come together, He can't resist because He is a Father. Hebrews 4 verse 16 Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us come. We will find his mercy and his grace.